This morning's session is on looking at the impact of leaving the EU and the UK's new trading setup on healthcare and health generally. Um, I'd like to welcome all of our witnesses and I'll get them shortly to introduce themselves. If I can ask both witnesses and fellow commissioners to be on mute if you're not speaking just to avoid feedback. So if I can now ask our witnesses if you can just introduce yourselves and just the organization that you represent. If we start with Martha. Hi, uh, I'm Martha McCary. I am a researcher at the Nuffield Trust. This includes pretty significant amount of work on the impact of Brexit and changing international relations on healthcare in the UK. And Peter. Peter, do you want to introduce yourself? Apologies, Chair. Um, Peter Ellingworth, I'm the Chief Executive of the Association of British Health Tech Industries. We represent um, medical consumables, implanted devices, robots, AI, the whole suite of non-biopharma. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Tamara? Hello, I'm Tamara Harvey. Most people call me Tammy, please do. Uh, I work at City University of London, and I'm a professor of European Union law. I've uh, been working on European Union health law for oh, several decades. Uh, Kate? Hello, uh, my name's Kate Ling, and I'm the Senior European Policy Manager at the NHS Confederation in our international team. Um, I've been working for a long time on particularly issues relating to uh, the impact of Brexit on the National Health Service and Thank trade you. deals going and trade deals going forward, of course. OK, which is a key topic this morning and yourself, Nick. Hi, I'm Nick Mann. I'm a GP, uh, been a doctor for 33 years, um, really coming to this from a clinical perspective and with a long term keen interest in health, uh, the NHS function and policy. Um, and an NHS campaigner, a member of Keep Our NHS Public. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you very much and thank you all for um, your time. I'm going to kick off with the first couple of questions and you don't need to answer everything in one question because we will try to unpick the different themes as we go through. If I can ask you to keep your answers relatively succinct and you don't need to repeat what's already been said. So um, add to what colleagues have maybe said before you. Um, if I can start with yourself, Tammy, um, what would you say, and, and again, just the headlines here, are the key challenges to UK healthcare at the moment? Um, I, that's probably, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question because I'm not a UK, primarily a UK focused researcher, but off the top of my head from what I see from collaboration with colleagues who are, um, and for people to add to, uh, I would say staffing is right at the top. Um, and then I would probably put finance after that. And then um, supply chains after that. So there's a start. And let's let people add to that. OK, if we come to yourself and Martha, obviously Nuffield uh, Trust have been doing quite a lot of work around the impact of leaving the EU on healthcare. You're You're muted. Um, I think yeah. I'd, so I'd follow on from all the points that uh, that Tammy has raised and say that some of those I need to point out are fairly long term and I'd say Brexit has probably exacerbated them more than anything else. But the points that I'd want to add are probably poor capital funding. So things like building an IT being in a really poor state, really no numbers of diagnostic machines, for instance, for population in the UK. Um, Social care strikes me as being in a particularly poor state right now, um, with a really big lack of clarity as to how the future capacity and funding is going to pan out. Um, and also, I think it's more of a, of a problem about the, the, the state of population health in itself and, and health outcomes. We have obviously a growing population which is aging, but we've also got population that is ailing without aging in a sense, and an increase in, in, in inequalities and 
how health would look in the long term between the more deprived and the wealthier populations in the UK, which I, I think we can go on to in a little bit more detail later on. Yeah, obviously the social determinants of health and we live longer, but we're not yet living well, um, unfortunately. Um, Nick, obviously you're actually on the front line as, as a GP. I mean, I'm sure you would agree with the headline comments we've had from Tammy and Martha, but are there any others that you think we haven't brought to the table already? Um, well, the problem pressures are both domestic and international. Um, uh, yes, um, poor resourcing, uh, staffing and infrastructure over 13 years is absolutely key. And the Nuffield and the King's Fund and the Lord's Health Select Committee have all produced reports to that effect. Um, um, and as regards trade deals, uh, we are in a very precarious position and uh, it depends who we're making those trade deals with, I think that really affects the health sector. Um, I would also mention privatisation. Uh, it's an extremely contentious issue, but the evidence for it, I think is, it, it's not only right in front of your face, but it goes back you know, in policy documents to the late 70s and early 80s uh, in the Tory policy documents. And actually, if you rev revise those documents, what's happening now is exactly what was in those documents. So I'd be happy to expand on that if anyone's interested. Yeah, we, we, we'll unpack quite a lot of these things. Peter, if we can come to you next, obviously you're from a slightly different angle from others. Yeah, indeed. So recognise and agree with everything everyone has said thus far. Um, one of the things that relates directly to health, the first thing is the slowness and the adoption of technology. And by technology, I mean anything um, under that health tech banner, um, whether it's implantable or at the far end of AI. So the NHS remains slow in doing so and needs to bring a better structure to the collaboration between industry and health as partners. Um, as Nick has said, some of these things are very long term. Um, I think there is a bright spot in the future for that with some work that's going on with uh, NHS England at the moment. Second big thing is regulatory. Um, Brexit created a, uh, a break with Europe. And what we're seeing in Europe at the moment is that the UK uh, medical device regulations um, system is in failure. Um, it was newly introduced. It keeps getting postponed. Um, Brexit provides us with an opportunity uh, to do something that is unique for the UK around a resilience model. I'm very happy to come back to that later. Um, the third thing I would say is we are in a period, and you know, Nick mentioned the 70s, of unprecedented inflation and right now the um, restrictions on buying products because they can't be increased in price is meaning that many of the international companies which provide a large bulk of the product into the UK are going elsewhere. I'll leave it there for now. Okay, thanks Peter and obviously unfortunately we don't have a representative of ABPI or the pharmaceutical industry but I assume that some of their issues at least will be very similar to those of medical devices around uh, early adoption, regulation, et cetera. Yes, and both are fundamental, just to build on that. The life sciences, vision, strategies, whatever you wish to call it, or the government's currently calling it, um, are great documents and with terrific intent. And unless we fix the collaboration between industry and the health system, and we fix the regulatory environment, um, it will unfortunately be just another great piece of paper. Okay, and to yourself, Kate. Or anything else that you would like to to add to um, well, what is uh, quite a depressing list <laughs> uh yeah same as everyone else uh workforce supply has to be top of the list uh to cope with the ever increasing demand of social care as well as, as health um, of an older and sicker population uh stubbornly persisting health inequalities and disparities uh long-term funding and sustainability of the current model and i'd like to pick up on what uh, peter just said about um, I think one of the challenges we face is making the most of the opportunity from trade deals uh, for the NHS, and that includes um, doing our best to influence and, um, if you like, impact on the regulatory environment. Okay, and um, obviously we'll we'll unpack some of that. That some of my colleagues uh, on the commission will impact some of those uh, issues more uh, specifically. If I can um, start with yourself. Um, uh, Martha, this time perhaps, um, looking obviously 
the UK has left the EU. We are uh, both Peter and Kate have mentioned regulation. We have the retained EU law bill going through uh, the parliament at the moment, which is going to change the regulatory landscape, both from the point of view of healthcare delivery, but also what has already been talked about wider public health. Um, so what would you say are the changes or how have the changes in both the international position of the UK and its trading and its regulation, how is that affecting both the health and social care sector? Or we could even just say the health sector in the sense of actually promoting better health. If we start with yourself and then I'll come around colleagues. You're muted, Martha. Sorry again. Um, I'll start this by saying I think other colleagues on the call are probably in a, a better place to go into this in more detail. But if I had to kind of outline it, um, every every aspect of the healthcare system is is affected by trade trade relations um, and uh, Brexit certainly. Um, and so the way we originally looked at this when we were first sort of researching this area was look at WHO building blocks of, of a healthcare system. Um, and they, they all are. So we look at, at health service de delivery, it's affected. Um, workforces, we're going to go into more detail, um, exchanges of information and how we make sure that kind of crosses borders seamlessly. Um, the way products sort of go from one country to the next and what happens when trade barriers come up. Um, and financing and leadership in, in, in governments. Um, I think we could say for Brexit itself, we avoided the worst impacts that we'd anticipated by avoiding an ODIL agreement um, in, in lots of ways um, and the trading cooperation agreement. However, I, nothing nothing in in this come close to the benefit of um single market membership but i i'd like to pass on to, to tammy more on the regulatory front okay then if we come to yourself next tammy um so both the 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 impact of brexit itself but also where we're going forward the shift from europe to asia if you like in trade and uh, the change in the regulatory landscape. Colleagues will unpack some of those things specifically, but how much do you think that is impacting health and social care in the UK? So I, I think in order to come to a, a better answer to this, we need to get into the more granular things. So it, 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 may, it may be that, um, it may be that we, we just do this question very quickly and then get into some more depth so I don't have a lot to add to what Martha has said. Um, the, in, in terms of the, the things that we looked at, not being in the single market puts the UK in a worse, worse position in a number of respects. But it also opens up potential possibilities in other respects. Um, what I think is really missing is an honest public discussion about the pros and cons of different trade arrangements and different other types of arrangements like human migration arrangements with other parts of the world and the pros and cons of different regulatory positions so you know we already heard from peter a very strong call for a particular regulatory position what, what we need to do i think is to have a, an all stakeholders included honest public conversation about the pros and cons of different regulatory positions internally and what those mean for our external relations um, in, in terms of markets that are global and in terms of a workforce for the healthcare system that, you know, for the time being and going forward, the UK is not going to be self-sufficient in workforce. There was one other preliminary comment, if I may, Chair. Which yes, is, of I, I would like to remind colleagues that there is no the NHS in the UK. There's NHS England, and there are separate health systems in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And I, I do think that sometimes public debates become focused on NHS England and forget the other nations or devolved or administrations, whatever word you prefer, colleagues, in the United Kingdom. So from time to time, um, Chair, if I may, I, I may remind us of other, and I'm sure other commissioners will also do the same thing, uh, that it's not all about NHS England. 
Uh, well, as uh, a Scottish MP and a breast cancer surgeon for over 30 years in NHS Scotland, I'm grateful for your comments. Um, if we can go to Kate next. Obviously, from Hello. the NHS Confederation point of view. Yes, I should point out um, in relation to what Tammy said that the NHS Confederation represents NHS organisations across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Curiously, not Scotland, though obviously we do talk to our Scottish colleagues, but just to uh, make that clear that we we don't just represent England. Um, yeah, the question was about changes to the trading landscape and the UK's international relations, how that's affected the healthcare sector. Um, very briefly, the, the overall trading landscape, the obvious things are the um, the global supply chain issues that have been painfully exposed, for example, during COVID and the need to diversify and to future proof our supply chain and all of that related to the rise of China, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, and the resulting impact on that closer to home, the rise in inflation, cost of living crisis, um, increase in poverty, et cetera. Um, the biggest change for international relations has to be leaving the, the UK, leaving the EU and I guess we'll be unpicking various aspects of this later on, but very briefly, that's impacted um, supply, the import and export of um, medical products. It's impacted the composition of the healthcare and social care workforce. It's impacted on healthcare research and collaboration, um, and also on um, the regulatory landscape in respect of licensing medicines and medical devices. So those are just some of the things that have been impacted, but I guess that has to be the biggest shift, if you like, away from regulatory um, alignment with um, the EU towards looking towards other jurisdictions. And, and particularly, uh, obviously, all of you have raised uh, workforce and that loss of freedom of movement and the impact. We saw that in the vast drop in EU nurses coming to the UK immediately after the referendum, almost 90% drop in EU nurses registering in the UK, and, and yet they still could. So even that is just the impression that we are giving of people of whether they would feel welcome or not. Uh, Peter, if I can come to you next. Okay, a couple of uh, qualifiers to begin. I forgot to mention, um, I do have a non-disclosure agreement with the Department now of Business and Trade um, because I'm an advisor on free trade agreements, but that shouldn't constrain unless it's very specific questions. Uh, second is, Chair, I'm a global Scot, despite my accent. Um, I was born in Glasgow and I'm a very proud global Scot. Um, the EU, yeah, the fundamental change for trade was the fact that Perhaps many people thought we would end up trading with the EU. That's a complete misnomer. We now trade with 27 different nations. Um, and what um, interrupted supply and continues to interrupt supply is the fact that um, the movement of product and componentry is not seamless because each of the EU members has its own particular trading arrangements. And from an exporting point of view, there are many, uh, we have something like 4,000 small companies in the UK in wider health technology, devices, diagnostics. Um, they find it very, very difficult now to trade with EU countries, and in particular, um, some of those in the south of Europe, um, where they've got some very odd restrictions. So trade, those companies are now looking elsewhere in the world, which does inform what our trading policy should be, and the CPTPP arrangement is actually um, good for a number of fronts. Not at least it opens up that part of Asia, but it also from a future regulatory. The big thing that's um, interrupted us here has been around regulation and um, Northern Ireland agreement not really impacting devices at the moment and diagnostics like it is the pharmaceutical industry. However, the important piece here is that um, whether you were a Remainer or a Brexiteer, we are now a sovereign nation and we need to act differently on regulation. That doesn't mean, and we are engaged, I'm engaged in the balance review on regulation and um, it's public knowledge. The Life Science Council, which I sit on, has created a work stream with MHRA, Office of Life Sciences, Department of Health and ourselves as industry to look at future models. And the Chancellor made a statement during the budget that the UK would look to work with um, a reliance model, which uh, is based on trusted jurisdictions. What does that mean? 
That means that th places like Canada, Australia, Japan, um, the US with the FDA have very good regulatory systems. And for to be clear but brief, 80% plus of device regulation is common worldwide under the INDRF or International Medical Device Regulators Forum principles. So that's good news because that's a positive sovereign choice that says you don't need to create your own regulations. Why would you when you're only about three, four percent of the global market? That would be a significant barrier to trade inward and export. But you can make choices as a sovereign nation that you couldn't when you were part of the EU, which is to say, you know, the 510k is actually a better process now than the EU. So I'll leave it there and we can get into more detail, Chair, as you wish. Thank you. Yeah, it'll get it'll get picked up by colleagues as we go through in more detail. And finally, Nick for yourself on this question. Um, the domestic and uh, and international changes, uh, we've had the uh, Health and Social Care Act 2012, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID. Um, the, I, I agree, I mean, for, in terms of trade, um, clearly the, the aim is to reduce um, barriers to trade and that involves uh, ease of regulation. And I'd raise um, a, a slight warning there, really, because what I've been seeing over the last five to 10 years is a significant reduction in the uh, quality and standards breaks, checks and balances that are put on uh, drugs and medical devices. I understand from what I've read that it's the UK's intention to basically rubber stamp the FDA and the EMA, uh, which would which would lighten our load in terms of regulation and the uh, sort of putting that on the on a slightly expanded MHRA may or may not be adequate. There are a couple of good examples. I see Peter shaking his head, but um, for instance, um, you know, we had what we're seeing is industry led regulation increasingly. Um, there is industry input into the MHRA and NICE which is not wholly uh, what I would say in keeping with medical peer, critical peer review where drugs and medical devices are licensed. I mean, we have the example of the Babylon chatbot, which was promoted by the Secretary of State um, and was proven in fit, was inadequately tested, um, not peer reviewed, not critically peer reviewed, put on the market and shown to have life threatening uh, risks attached to use of the chatbot and that's not been dealt with nor the regulation for that another example from the fda they um licensed they passed uh aducanumab ad helm a so-called groundbreaking um uh, uh, treatment for dementia which in fact is not groundbreaking at all it's not a game changer as was claimed and in fact in the fda uh, several members of the fda resigned as a result of the fda passing aducanumab uh, for passing its licensing um, and there is actually a, 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 a subsequent drug, um, which is now, go again, NICE hasn't yet approved that. And there's another one which NICE is holding back on uh, called Lecanemab, which has 20% uh, of the people who took that drug had brain bleeds. Um, and that is, <laughs> you know, uh, you don't have to be a doctor to know that a side effect of 20% of people having brain bleeds it should give very big pause for thought. And what I'm saying is that that licensing was pushed through against the advice of the independent specialists to the FDA. The FDA, for whatever reason, chose to approve it. And I suspect that was industry pressure. Um, and then that resulted in resignation of a, a, a number of the FDA members. So two examples, and I've got more. Um, uh, we 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 can go into more later. Now we need to uh, yeah. we need to move on. But obviously, we get your key point, which is your concern about a change in regulatory landscape, which is going to happen, being industry led rather than balanced between uh, industry, patient safety, and medical expertise. 
Um, okay, as, as I said, all of these issues will get unpacked by colleagues as we go forward. Um, the first is the, our next commissioner, Mike Cohen. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pick on, on something that's uh, already been raised and see if we can go into a little bit more detail. Uh, my question is about how international regulatory alignment affects trade in medical products, be that pharmaceuticals, consumables, technology, whatever it may be. Um, and I'm interested to know if you see any conflict between free trade agreements um, and how, how we avoid the friction that that might create. Could I start with Kate, because you've raised some of these issues already, and then I'll just follow along the line as it appears on my screen. Thanks. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think when we're talking about regulation, picking up on some of the things Nick was saying, I don't think it's true to say that the UK is thinking of rubber stamping other jurisdictions' decisions. Um, I think from the point of view of patients and access to um, safe and reliable medicines and medical devices, that the more convergence there can be globally in international regulatory standards, the easier it will be uh, for us to trade goods and services across borders and to speed up licensing and access um, to the products that we need in the UK. So it, there's a very delicate balance there, obviously. Um, but I think that it's possible for different jurisdictions to recognize each other's standards as equivalent without them being identical. Uh, they can be different and achieve the same outcomes. Um, and I know this is a complex area, um, but I think it's in the interests of patients to make sure that they have access um, quickly to the latest innovations, um, but also to make sure that those are safe, of course. So um, I know that um, other, other witnesses will um, give details about the various, um, I mean, Peter's mentioned the medical devices, um, uh, the International Medical Device Regulators Forum and Medical Devices Single Audit Authorities Program and, you know, all these ways in which the regulatory authorities um, collaborate internationally. And I think that's a good thing. And the more we do of that, the better. Um, from the point of view, do, do um, the FJs conflict with each other? How can trade frictions be avoided? Um, I think in the new, in the free trade agreements that the UK is signing, as far as possible, the government needs to seek to be consistent and to adopt a standardised approach across its free trade agreements uh, to, as far as possible, avoid that happening. Um, it makes life much easier for businesses if they have to um, follow as few as possible different sets of rules. And Peter referred to having to deal with 27 different uh, rules from different member states in the EU instead of one single block. One of the advantages, of course, of being in the CPTPP will be that we'll be able to deal with those countries on block. Um, so that's, yeah, so I think that will make things, if it's easier for businesses, then it's better for the NHS because it means that the products get to the patients more easily. Um, the main area I would say to watch out for is about the friction between the agreements between the UK and the EU um, and the UK's new agreements with countries in the rest of the world, that if these free trade agreements contain provisions that diverge significantly from existing EU norms, um, you know, that there is the possibility that it could trigger retaliation under the level playing field provisions of the free trade um, agreement, of, of the, sorry, um, trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU. I think that's an area that Tammy and Martha probably can elaborate on. Um, there are, however, I, I can expound on this a bit more if you like. Um, there are built-in mechanisms in the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU to try to manage regulatory divergence through the Partnership Council and Joint Committee. And indeed, I myself represent the NHS on the Domestic Advisory Committee that um, sorry, domestic advisory group that um, advises the government, um, particularly on issues of regulatory divergence and mobility. Um, the role of this group is to flag up concerns over divergence and propose solutions to problems with implementation. So there are built-in mechanisms, but I think that's an area to watch out for. It's more about conflict between uh, what we do, I think, with the EU and what we do with countries in the rest of the world um, than perhaps uh, conflict between different trade agreements with different uh, trading blocks. And I think we need to move away from this binary idea of, well, you know, either we align, you know, either it's the EU or it's the rest of the world. 
and to look towards much greater global convergence of regulatory standards. I think this is already happening, but I will pass over to other witnesses. Thank you very much for that. Uh, um, next on my screen is Tammy. Can I pass over to you, please? Thank you, Mike. Um, this is probably the question that I have the most to say about, so please bear with me, colleagues. So I think probably the most important thing to say here is that it's really essential to think at a granular and detailed level when we're thinking about regulatory alignment in medical products or the products that the NHS needs. And sweeping or oversimplified or ideologically based statements at best don't help, and at worst they obfusc obfuscate realities that are actually complex. So I think it's important to disaggregate regulatory alignment of the research phase, the authorization and approval phase, regulatory safety and compliance in the market, and then purchasing and providing. And all of these areas of medical products regulation, and here I mean medicines and devices and equipment and other things that the NHS needs, they're all covered by EU law to a greater or lesser extent. So the UK leaving the EU means it, or rather Great Britain, given the UK's obligations um, under the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, even with the Windsor framework, um, the UK is no longer obliged to remain aligned with the EU in these aspects of regulation of, of medical products. Then the second thing that's really important when we're thinking and talking about regulatory alignment, it's important to differentiate between alignment in terms of regulatory content, the substance of laws or policies, where for many things, but not all things, um, there are global standards and alignment in terms of regulatory governance or processes where UK institutions make decisions which are or are not aligned with decisions made by institutions in other trade blocks, particularly the EU or other countries. Then, as has already been said by Kate, regulatory alignment or not matters because the current strategies pursued by the UK or GB policymakers limit the UK's future degrees of freedom, either because of trade or other agreements or in practice, and that has an effect on the NHS. And then, uh, thirdly, the UK's position in terms of regulatory alignment with the EU can be seen in one of three orientations. It's either parallel with the EU, where the UK makes deliberate policy choices to stay in step with the EU, because bear in mind that EU policy and legal approach for medical products has not stayed still since EU law ceased to apply in the UK. Or it can be divergent from the EU, where UK or GB policymakers make deliberately di different choices from the EU's, or it can be drifting where the UK makes few or no deliberate choices, meaning we've got an initial alignment, but then divergence when the EU changes regulatory content, institutional structures or practices. So if, if I may, Chair, to elaborate, to go to regulatory content, for some medical products like pharmaceuticals or vaccines or standard medical devices, underlying standards are internationally determined. We've heard that already. For others like data governance, there are substantive differences between major global jurisdictions. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, sorry, regulatory governance, the process, the institutions and processes through which compliance, for example, with clinical trials rules or product safety and efficacy rules are shown, those um, aspects of, of Iran are, are already different. The EU does not recognize processes in countries other than the EEA states as sufficient to secure access to the EU market. So when the UK left the EU, it was immediately divergence in terms of regulatory governance. So the medicines agency, European Medicines Agency, relocated to Amsterdam, no longer recognised or worked with the MHRA. And the MHRA took on power to approve many medicines that was previously reserved to EU level marketing authorisations. In the short term, though, the UK remained aligned in terms of regulatory content, and that would remain the case until the EU's regulatory content rules changed, unless the UK took active steps to remain aligned. And what our research with the, the Nuffield Trust has found is that there's a rhetoric of divergence in government circles associated with sovereignty as a good in its own right and so on, um, and with seeing reduced regulation as a strong determinant of improved economic performance. And that might be contrasted with what we heard from industry, from policy actors within the NHS and from civil society, who are much more interested in alignment with the EU. But in fact, what we have is a much more complex picture in terms of legal and policy reality. So for both clinical trials of medicines and medical devices, the EU has, as we've already 
briefly heard, the EU has significantly changed its regulatory content since EU law ceased to apply in Great Britain. And further changes are in the pipeline. For example, the European Union's um, Artificial Intelligence Act would categorize most uses of AI as a medical tool as high risk, so subject to significant risk assessment measures and human oversight. We found about five areas where the UK has a parallel regulatory orientation, at least in terms of regulatory content. And the implications of being in parallel, again, which Kate has mentioned, include being part of a larger proximate market with all that flows from that in terms of business and trade decisions to contract with NHSs within the UK, the basis on which UK entities are able to procure products from global or European markets, or decisions to locate clinical trials in the UK or to involve UK patients in clinical trials. Um, so almost no aspects here have the benefits of alignment of regulatory process, but a few do. So data adequacy, the UK is aligned in terms of both content and process at present. Um, the recognition of UK good manufacturing practice for medicines by the EU under the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement is one of a very few specific examples of aligned content and process here. Clinical trials, short-term divergence, but what we see is that the new UK system seeks to realign in practice despite contrary rhetoric. Then in terms of medicines authorizations, the UK currently recognizes EU authorizations and tries to apply the same international standards and processes, but more quickly where authorizations are sought from the MHRA. And then finally, in terms of medical devices, the UK is going to recognize CE marks for at least another five years, according to what we have discovered. Then we found about three areas where the UK is choosing divergence. One of these is medicines licensing with the innovative licensing and access pathway, which tries to link up MHRA and NICE requirements in a way that wouldn't be possible within the EU at this time, although the EU is moving in that direction. Secondly, we think procurement, but there's insufficient details in terms of what is, um, is being proposed here at present. And then thirdly, some aspects of medical devices regulation, for example, a proposed condensed trial process, which we've heard a little bit about already, basing standards on international rather than EU standards, allowing cooperation with um, the MDSAP and with other trading powers, particularly the USA, also Australia, Canada, Japan, and Brazil. So those are areas where the UK is actively choosing divergence. And then we found a number of areas where the UK is drifting. And the drifting is the thing that's probably of the most concern. So clinical trials at the moment seems to be an area of drift. Falsified medicines regulation is another area of drift. Authorizing or approving medical devices is a third area of drift. And funding streams is a fourth and very important area of drift until the point about collaboration in Horizon Europe is clarified. And the UK is still negotiating and has recently published a plan B for if that isn't, if Horizon Europe um, isn't part of it. So overall then, and apologies for the length of this answer, but this is the one that I've got the most to say on. Uh, coming to the, the bearing that regulatory alignment or not has on trade and consequently on the NHS. So first of all, regulatory alignment is important because it significantly eases trade flows. As we've already said, no free day trade agreement gives better access to the EU market than EEA membership or EU membership. No free day trade agreement replicates the benefits that flow from being part of the large EU market. EU, sorry, UK non-alignment in terms of process, regulatory governance, has already had important effects. So the end of mutual recognition within EU membership of multiple aspects of medical products relations means higher costs and a greater burden on researchers, producers and importers. The need to go through a different process for access to the UK market because different bodies are responsible makes the UK less attractive as a market and a smaller global player. Accepting EU pro approvals and processes keeps costs lower, but it makes the UK a passive rule taker. And it also means a need to follow effects of changes in U EU regulatory standards as they would be accepted in a changing UK regulatory space and market. So there's a need for a public conversation about whether that is the right thing to do at a granular level. 
Over time, drift matters because it's likely to impact investment decisions, research focus, and product availability within the NHS. And then we need to look at the interactions of alignment or non-alignment in different stages of the regulatory life cycle for medical products and the following rational actions of relevant actors. So in the longer term, EMA authorizations give access to a market of 500 million or so, so they're attractive to the global industry. Typically, novel medicines launch in the EU and the USA around six months to a year later than, say, Canada or Australia, because those are smaller markets. And GB is now one of those smaller markets. Um, those new expensive medicines don't usually become generally available in the NHS for some time because of the cost, especially where medicines are protected by intellectual property rights. But once they are licensed, they can be used by an individual patient within with the oversight of a clinician, or they can be part of a clinical trial, taking that medicine forward and comparing it with something newer. So once the UK becomes a country where licenses are granted later than in the EU, the UK then is no longer a place where best current technology is available, and that reduces the appeal of, a UK, of the UK as a place for a trial, because of course trials are best current versus new. So then the more that appeal is reduced, the more the UK drifts from being a place where global cutting edge clinical research takes place. We have some detailed research, which I can possibly report separately on medicines authorizations 18 months after the UK left the EU system. Um, it's quite difficult to do this research, but um, it, what we found aligns with analysis that Imperial College London shared with the Financial Times, which showed that in 2021, the EMA approved more new medicines in total than the MHRA. Um, and those divergences might illustrate the lesser appeal of the UK as a smaller market, or they might illustrate the capacity constraints at MHRA. I think that would be think, uh, helpful, sorry. Tamara, because yeah. obviously we, we have a lot to get through. And I would say that to any of the witnesses, if after the discussions today, you feel there are aspects we didn't manage to get into and you have uh, written submissions, please feel free to put them in and the team will, will pull them together. Um, back to yourself, Michael, though we are a wee bit running yeah, behind now. We are a little behind now. So if I could just ask the other witnesses who haven't spoken yet, if there's anything you particularly want to raise under this heading now, um, maybe you could kind of volunteer. Peter, I thought you might well have something to chuck in here. Um, if I go to Peter to be as, as brief as you possibly can, because we are overrunning now already, um, and then other points could maybe come up as we get to them later in the session. But if I could pass on to you to be uh, as brief as you can, Peter. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you to Tammy. It's a, a lot of sense in what she said there. And to Kate. Um, fundamentally, free trade agreements, there are no or very low tariffs on medical devices um, in trade agreements. Therefore, trade agreements that seek to look at minimising tariffs have no impact because it's not there. Regulation for any company coming to the UK with a product or exporting Number one is regulation. The first thing any small company looks at is what's the regulatory environment. Um, so that's fundamental in here. The other big thing in here, Mike, about regulation is the more alignment, and this is not giving away our sovereign authority. We've always recommended, and as far as I'm aware, the work that's going on with MHRA, we need a strong, and we've just advocated and got additional funding for MHRA, strong and independent regulator, um, they have the right to make decisions, no question about that. But alignment gives you, think of COVID, it gives you um, access to product during a pandemic when otherwise, if the product didn't have some commonality and regulation, you wouldn't be able to get access and security of supply chain. Um, products are made all over the world now. Forget about the issues around China or whatever. They're made all over the world. Componentry comes from around the world. If you have some forms of regulatory alignment, that allows things to operate. Look at airline regulation. Coming out of the EU meant we would have to sign 200 different agreements with airports around the world. It's not really helpful, wasn't part of a public debate. So security of supply and access for patients. Um, I can't talk about pharmaceuticals, but devices and diagnostics are incredibly complicated. There are over half a million products on the market. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for that, Peter. And I'm going to pass back to the chair now to introduce our next question. Thank okay, thanks very much, Mike. And, and I'm sure other witnesses, there will be aspects that are 
picked up again if I can give over to our Commissioner Tamara for the next two questions. Thank you, Chair. In what ways have the changes in the trading environment impacted the, the availability of healthcare workers in the UK? And what steps can be taken to alleviate labour shortages in the healthcare sector? Um, I'd like to start with Martha, please. I helpfully unmuting myself for this one. Um, so again, I think I think it's it's worth it's worth going back to existing long term trends um, and think of sort of changing a trading environment and, and Brexit having exacerbated them more than than anything else. So historically, the UK's health system extensively requires the migration. Uh, of, of healthcare staff and health and social care staff and has done so at times where it required surge capacity or it was facing um, shortages. Um, it, it's also true that the UK has and has on a, a, a long term had a fairly small number of doctors and EU nurses per population than say its peers in the OECD. Um, and sort of very significant issues linked to uh, pay and progression and retention and staffing uh, for doctors, uh, for, for nursing. We've seen estimates that we're, we're still going to look at shortages of around 35 to 40k by 2030 by the Health Foundation. Um, and obviously in general practice and in um, adult social care, um, where we, we've actually seen the level of vacancies increasing over the pandemic uh, and sort of an actual decrease in access uh, to social care by older people requiring it. Um, so COVID has obviously accentuated all of this. Uh, there was an absolute sort of cliff drop of um, of input from, from international healthcare workers leading to what's looked like essentially a missed year of, of recruitment. Um, if we look at sort of the direct effects of leaving the EU, um, those would look like a significant increase in uh, paperwork and costs. And that's not just for individual applicants trying to join, so bureaucracies and visa costs, but also for the institutions uh, managing those costs. And I would say that is particularly significant for adult social care, um, where there's a really high number of uh, small and medium enterprises who, who will increasingly find it find it difficult to um, deal with those costs. Um, on top of that, you look at a problem of well, evidence and or perceived uh, discrimination, the feeling of just feeling unwel unwelcome, what can be referred to as a hostile environment now extended to um, EU staff. That's something that's been raised through participants in our study, but can also kind of be seen uh, through NHS surveys in the last um, in the last few years. Indirectly, um, indirectly, what that looks like is a decrease in the attractiveness and also the salarial attractiveness on the UK, partly as a knock on of what I've just of what I've just mentioned. Um, we, we've also known this is separate studies that I can uh, link you to the Nuffield Trust is a quite important um, effect of professional networks coming from specific countries and specific uh, professions or, or medical specialties from those countries. So once that disruption starts, it's a bit like the, re the reverse effect of mm. what that profession network would have done. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the effect of this is essentially an even more massive shift towards international recruitment from overseas um, and not from the EU, including from uh, lower income countries. I think that's something we'll, we'll go we'll go on to um, in another in question. I think the steps that can be taken, it's really complicated. I mean, essentially, there's no short term fix that that international recruitment is going to happen in the shorter term and that there needs to be honest conversation, long term planning to understand what pay and retention is going to look like in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And crucially, that planning needs to include uh, surge capacity. And it needs to build in the notion that international recruitment is a short term fix. It just yeah. can't continue that way. Um, but I think I'm, I'm happy to pass on to um, Thanks. colleagues. Thank you, Martha. Kay, I wonder what your thoughts are. 
Um, yeah, Malta's just given a, a brilliant summary, um, you know, setting the historical context that UK has historically been dependent on um, you know, large amounts of overseas staffing, um, that we've always had a lower um, you know, doctor patient ratio, for example, than, um, th than the European norm, all of that. Mm. So I agree with everything that she's said. Um, the most obvious change really has been um, since Brexit has been the change in the composition of the healthcare workforce that uh, Philippa mentioned the massive reduction in nurses coming from the European economic area, though curiously not doctors, a very interesting difference between the professions there. Um, but compensated by the enormous rise in the numbers of international nurses coming from beyond the EU. And that's a continuation of a trend, I think, that started before Brexit, but has become incredibly marked since then. Um, and of course, now, you know, the current economic climate, the availability of other less onerous jobs at a similar level of pay, for example, in retail and hospitality um, for people at the lower echelons of the health and particularly social care sector is, you know, a really, really big problem. And we see that being played out at the moment, of course, in the industrial action um, in, you know, in the NHS. So um, I think we're pretty clear and, you know, Nuffield has done a huge amount of work, which Martha's explained about, um, we, we know what the figures are showing and what the situation is and understanding some of the motivation and if you like the push and pull factors bes um, behind um, why people decide to come and um, work in the UK or not. So that's about the international um, side of things. I don't know whether now or a later question is the best time to talk about retention, because actually the biggest problem that the NHS has got with its workforce at the moment is the rate at which people are leaving, um, nurses in particular leaving, um, you know, and people, people going early, early retirement, burnout, leaving for other, as I said, perhaps less emotionally and physically draining jobs. And retention is a really big, um, really, really big issue. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been supporting yeah. some work being done by the Royal Free on um, retention of staff because there's an, an, an epidemic of people leaving because they're, they're burnt out, stressed, they've come out of COVID and overwork. And yeah. I think all of these things are compounding what makes it attractive to be employed and then to stay in that job once you've got it, if, if there are other options that are more lucrative or um, Indeed. sustainable for your well-being. I, think that's, I don't that's know whether now it. or one of the later questions is the place to talk about um, what NHS employers are trying to do to stem the outflow um, or what could be done, but you know, either by government or by employers themselves. Um, that on the, you know, from the government point of view, um, there is a long, as Martha said, there's no short term fix. There's the long term workforce plan that's been commissioned from NHS England by the government, and we're awaiting mm. its recommendations. We, um, we do come to that, Kate, oh, in, good. In, in more detail. Paul Blumberg yeah. will be. So if you, I mean, I can bit more detail. They save that for Paul. Save that for right. Paul, Kate. And I, can, yeah, I can talk about um, things that um, NHS employers are doing to try to um, retain, to, to attract and retain staff. So domestic initiatives on um, recruiting people and then things they can do to make a better working environment to retain them. But if you like, I can hang on to those and say them later. Hang on for that, hang on for Paul for that. But I mean, it comes to, I think, yeah. what you were talking about, the those who are less well paid, it's the same in childcare. You know, the, the, pay, yeah. the pay scales for childcare versus retail are very similar. Um, and if you're being asked to look after more children with less support, inevitably you're going to look at alternatives. I'm really conscious of time, so unless uh, our other other um, evidence givers have any points, Peter, if you could just come in yeah, quickly. Very um, quickly, it's yeah. a global issue. I talked um, a few weeks ago with health leaders in the US, health system leaders, and they mentioned two things, availability of staff and burnout. So we aren't alone on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I'm going straight to my next question before I go back to the chair. What is the likely effect of demographic changes in the coming years going, going to be, that, that reads funny, going to be on the NHS? Is there any way that international agreements can be used to ease pressures on the UK's health sector? And I would like to start with Kate again, please. Um. Yeah, um, the sorry, the, 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 the demographic demographic changes. I think we covered that really in the first question about basically lots of older, sicker people, and of course the workforce are getting older as well. Um, 
but it's the second half of the question really um in what way can international agreements help to ease pressures on the nhs um staffing um it's, i mean I, I, there is no there is no quick fix absolutely um but certainly there are elements in trade agreements that could be used to encourage inward mobility um particularly for example government to government agreements regarding visas or training schemes um that would help to you know to encourage international recruitment um cost of the, well the, the cost of medicines and supplies that um we can keep costs down by reducing not so much tariff as peter said but non-tariff barriers so regulatory barriers that increase the cost of imports um and that therefore you know the availability and the cost to the nhs of um, medicines and medical devices and diversifying supply chains by accessing new markets. I think that's something that we can definitely achieve and the CPTPP may be um, a good thing from that point of view. Um, also boosting the UK's economy and exports that there's this, um, you know, th this argument that if we include, if we um, improve the economy overall, the nation's wealth, that will also um, improve people's health. This is a bit controversial because there'll be a differential impact. There'll be winners and losers. So there'll be some sectors and industries and regions that could benefit enormously from trade agreements with other countries because they've mm. got new and expanding industries and, mm. you know, there'll be job creation, um, regeneration, all of that. Um, and trade agreements can promote the UK as an attractive destination for investment. So there can be really big pluses. Um, but of course, there's also the downside that there will be some sectors and there have been speculation, for example, like the agricultural sector could um, lose out. And that affects not only jobs, but also the social fabric in the areas that are dependent on those industries. So we could see improvements in terms of longer term public health because of wealth and regeneration and general economic uplift. Or we could see it having a really bad effect in some areas and in some sectors so um yeah i think i think that's probably most of what i wanted to say but there are also there are opportunities there are upsides and downsides put it that way but there are things that could help to ease the pressures yeah i just want to go to nick please if that's okay same question thank you um I'd like to draw attention. So the increasing aging population, um, the UN did some work on this and uh, it, I don't think it's quite as bleak as uh, as we've been told for the last 10 years. The the uh, the population's increasing probably till about 2100. It'll level off at 11 billion. So going up from seven to 11 billion. And in the time between now and 2100, which is another lifetime for the NHS, um, there'll be an increase of two billion uh, people age 30 to 60 and 2 billion people over 60. So we are going to see an increased productive workforce, uh, which is there to support our older people. In terms of healthy life expectancy, which is actually the key for individuals and populations um, within the UK, we're very much looking at the upstream stuff that, that you know, Michael Marmot has done lots and lots of work on in terms of um, public health and the determinants for public health, which are simple things like um, having a, a healthy working population, childcare, adequate food, adequate housing, education, etc. Um, and those are going to be as impactful, I think, um, in terms of our future health. Um, Economic growth is an obvious one, uh, but that's that's complicated. <laughs> that is complicated and beyond my remit. Um, I think in terms of international agreements being used to ease pressures on the NHS, I think there are two ways to look at that. If we're looking at US-UK trade deal, and in my mind, that is the thing that looms largest in this context, um, we need to be extremely careful about their access to our drug pricing. I mean, mm. the the lobbyists from mm. the US have been very, very active for the last more than 10 years. Um, the Alliance for Healthcare Competitiveness, which was pretty much led, steered and introduced by Simon Stevens, explicitly talks about, repeatedly and explicitly talks about breaking open the NHS market um, this, and uh, worldwide exporting their, I would say, failing health system 
um, to uh, to state and breaking up state owned enterprises. That's their key and they're aimed at the UK and they want we get drugs much cheaper than the states. You know, we'll pay 15 pounds for a bottle of insulin. They'll pay over 100 pounds. They want that inequality as they see it redressed. So uh, we could lose a lot in terms of finance in a US UK trade deal. And I think that's something that we need to go in armed and ready for. Uh, indeed, you know, the Cato um, Institute, along with Daniel Hannan, produced uh, a blueprint for the ideal US UK trade agreement. And indeed, the NHS was specifically mentioned as being included. And that might contrast with the CPTPP conclusions, uh, which had a little paragraph specifically excluding the NHS, although actually you need lawyers to look at the detail of that to see what that really means. Um, I mean, I think I think for me, Nick, not as someone from the medical profession, but looking at this from a policy perspective, that is a headline point that you've just raised there about not only our identity as a country or four nations with an NHS, but also what, when we're going into trade deals as the smaller partner, what's on the table and what, what are we going to be forced into um, outside of our relationship now we're outside of the EU and going into a, a, a trading relationship with the US, which uh, for me, having met with civil servants before we'd left, that was their ambition was to get that deal, so to get that over the table, what's at, what's at cost. Um, Indeed. And I think yeah, we're in the most it's a massive vulnerable, issue. We're in the most vulnerable position possible yeah, <laughs> as regards course. the NHS and uh, nationally. I feel to go into that kind of deal with the US. Um, in terms of what you know, international agreements to ease our pressures. Well, we should be lobbying for the EU staff return. Um, at half of the new uh, NMC um, Nursing and Midwifery Council uh, new applicants over the last year, and half of the new GMC applicants for the last year were born overseas um, and in terms of the nurses uh, it, only six uh, no sorry this is total for the health service only 663 out of 22,700 were from the EU so we, you know the EU should be our primary market actually for um, trade in staff and skills Thank you. Um, I'm aware of time and that we've run over. Um, Tamara from Atamara, hello. Uh, do you have a point that I see your hand up? You have um, another couple of minutes. So yeah, okay, good. I'm always worrying point. about running over. A couple over minutes. <laughs> okay. You go. <laughs> Conscious that I've spoken a lot already. Quick addition to what Nick said. Um, of course, the health and social care workforce on the island of Ireland is basically one workforce. So right. closer alignment with the EU uh, would definitely assist in that regard. Um, there is a concern about drift of um, recognition of qualifications and training routes because we are diverging from the EU standards which apply to Ireland. And then the other thing is just to add to what Kate said, um, in terms of trade agreements being a route to, for economic development, that isn't going to help the NHS or public health without active policies of redistribution. I mean, in many ways, this seems to be about our identity as a as a nation. Um, the, and the NHS seems to be the pawn in, in a lot of this story. It's what's coming across. Um, do our other evidence givers have any points? Yes. Just a quick one, uh, or quick two. Um, I, I agree with Nick, the NHS shouldn't be on the table here. Um, and, you know, that's something we, we'd have complete agreement on it. It's a it's a jewel in the crown in the UK. It's socially funded. It's part of our DNA as a country. Uh, I, I think that um, there are a couple of things that could help and they don't necessarily need trade agreements per se, but more cooperation. If you look at um, dementia in Japan, if you look at musculoskeletal in the US, just as two examples, Potentially, there are ways to learn and share best practice um, and use technology and innovation in technology, as we have done since the inception of the NHS to improve efficiency of care, to continue to do that and find ways of reducing operating times, reducing you know, hospital stays, remote managing of patients. 
Um, you know, and I, you know, notwithstanding again, Nick, what you said about, um, you know, we need to regulate AI and uh, data enabled technologies really well. Uh, we do. Um, they can play a good role, but we have to do that carefully. Patient safety being first. Thank you, Tamara. Thank, thank you. Um, Martha hasn't put her hand up, so I, I take it you don't have a point to add? No, okay. I mean, just from my point, although you're saying that it's not on the table, social housing has been on the table for the last 30 years. So unless we fight for these causes, um, you know, they are easily lost. Um, but on that point, I'll defer back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tamara. And we now come to Paul Bloomfield. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Philippa. And to the question that Kate wants to answer. <laughs> um, so returning to the, uh, the, the the staffing crisis, Kate, earlier you mentioned the obvious problems, and others did too, of retention. Um, I think the other there's obviously a problem at the other end as well in terms of recruitment. I was talking to uh, the vice chancellor of our lo local university on the non medic non medic health education programs and applications this year are down across the country uh, by 20 percent so not only are we losing people um, in service we're failing to recruit those we need so the crisis clearly is very deep you and uh, martha have both said that there's no short-term fix um without uh, international recruitment but you were indicating that there is perhaps, there's perhaps some mitigation that you wanted to share with us in terms of what could be done but i also wondered in terms of the the, the kind of longer term and Mar martha talked about the history of the nhs there is there is a kind of ethical consideration isn't there about the uk mopping up um talent from around the world where it's also desperately needed so i wondered if you could perhaps explore both of those issues kate right there's a lot there so i'll try to be brief um no, there isn't a short term fix, but there are things that are happening. So there's three strands, really. There's uh, domestic recruitment, domestic retention and, um, if you like, ethical international recruitment. So um, taking them in order, um, there are a lot of domestic initiatives going on. Um, you've just mentioned um, fall in, num in numbers of people applying for a lot of um, courses. But there certainly has been a very increase, big increase in the number of training places, for example, not only for doctors and nurses, but also for you know, allied health professionals. So there are more places available, uh, more training being offered, I think, than ever before. So there's certainly a big push to try to, um, you know, to get people to into healthcare professions and healthcare careers. And I'm aware of a great deal, our members um, in the NHS Confederation, who are the NHS trusts if, effectively, um, there's huge amounts of um, collaborations going on locally between, for example, healthcare trusts and um, their local universities and training colleges in trying to um, encourage not only young people, also older people um, into um, healthcare education courses. So we're not just talking about doctors and nurses, we're talking about, um, well, things like growing your own partnerships, um, apprenticeships and um, encouraging people in at every level, really, and a lot of emphasis on, um, what shall I put it, sort of um, increment, incremental progression, I suppose. In other words, bringing people in at the bottom, possibly at a, you know, at an entry level and then encouraging them. There are a lot of schemes to do with, um, you know, training and career pathways. Uh, so, for example, you could come in as a, um, you know, a healthcare assistant, um, progress to be a nursing assistant. Um, there's now these, if you like, new professions, such as being a nurse associate or a physician associate. You can gradually work your way up the ladder while you're earning, because in the past, obviously, one of the things that's put people off has been they, you know, you can't afford to give up your job enough to go back to college, basically, to start at the bottom again or to start studying. So it's now possible for people to continue to work and earn a salary. Um, in a healthcare job, whilst at the same time being supported in training and getting more qualifications and getting higher up the ladder. And I think there has been um, quite a bit of success um, from that. There's also various schemes, for example, involving um, recruiting people from the armed forces, the step into health scheme and, you know, targeting particular populations. So there have there are certainly examples um, um, NHS employers with a capital E, which is the organisation that represents all of the NHS employers with a small E, um, 
certainly across England, they've got various good examples and case studies where there have been very successful local partnerships. Obviously, that is not true in every part of the country and every trust, but there certainly are good things that are going on at a local level. Um, in terms of retention, you know, hanging on to the staff that you've got, pay obviously is a really huge issue at the moment, and the employer's hands are clearly tied by the amount of money that's available from central government, so I probably don't need to say any more about that. So they're having to look at ways of improving working conditions, and by that I don't just mean perks, um, such as things like you know gyms or parking or um, help with childcare, but the whole package of having a if you like a non-toxic and supportive working culture which particularly post covid is really important to people and people will often stay in a job which is perhaps not the best paid job they could get but because it's an you know it's an environment where where they feel valued and where you know where, where they feel they're doing a worthwhile job and they're enjoying it and a lot of people are not enjoying working in the health service at the moment because of the pressures and you know the, the, the difficulties so trusts are trying to do as much as they can locally um, to support staff who are feeling demoralized um, you know there's this um, idea of if you like moral injury people staff feel awful because they can't provide the quality of care that they would like to provide and that is you know psychologically um, depressing so anything that trusts can do to try to create a better working environment um, many of them are trying to do. I would like to say just, I'm sorry, sorry, I'll try and speed up a bit of it and get onto the international bit. Um, I have to say that longer term, it can't just be about more and more and more staff. You can't end up with, you know, half the population working in health and social care. There has to be a way of looking at delivering services differently, um, more preventative services, um, mm. services closer to home and out of hospital, um, more digital service provision where that's appropriate. Um, and simply ways of, I say, doing things differently because you can't just keep on throwing more and more and more staff, I think, um, at the health and social care sector. But as far as um, ethical international recruitment is concerned, yes, there are a lot of concerns about um, the ethics of recruiting staff from countries that could do with the healthcare staff themselves. There is, um, you know, a list of countries that the NHS is not allowed to proactively recruit from so not allowed to actually go out fishing having said that it's extremely i mean if you look at the people who've registered with the gmc and nmc for example recently um there's there are a lot of people coming from those countries but they come on an individual basis because there's nothing to stop them doing so um so there's a difference between proactively fishing and accepting people who apply to register in the uk um so in terms of ethical recruitment, the NHS has a code of practice on ethical international recruitment and a list of agencies who abide by it, who are the agencies, organisations that NHS employers are required to use if they're going down that route. And there are sanctions for um, organisations who don't meet the standards. I mean, agencies do get thrown off the list. Um, we've I, I attend something called the Cavendish Coalition, which is a a coalition of healthcare employers and trade unions and we do hear horror stories from uh, trade unions about sort of abuse and exploitation for example from overseas workers more largely i have to say in the private um small sort of um social care sector but we're very conscious that 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 does happen and the aim of the code of practice is to stop that happening so it's not just about um recruiting own well about recruiting from countries that aren't on the so-called red list but also things like treating people decently once they arrive in the uk um providing pastoral care and support not insisting on um exploitative um what do you call it when, when people break their contracts early and trying to make them pay back the money basically we've come across very bad instances of that um so the you know the code of practice has recently been strengthened and i think it does have some teeth um, I think it is reasonably effective. And um, on a more positive note, there are long-standing partnerships between certain NHS trusts and other countries, often because of um, personal relationships, for example, between clinical and managerial staff. Um, I think some of the most successful schemes have been where um, there are state-to-state -state agreements. So, for example, the UK has agreements with countries like India or the Philippines, which deliberately train and export their surplus nurses and 
there are things like there has been in the past the earn, learn and return scheme where um, there's an agreement that staff are recruited en masse from another country, but there's something in it. It's not just a benefit for the UK because we get the staff, but they get the opportunity to study for a qualification to um, improve their skills and to return to their home country, you know, with something positive that they can offer. So I think that's a good example of something that's mutually beneficial. So yes, there are uh, there are certainly some shocking examples of unethical international recruitment going on, um, though hopefully mostly not, or I, I would like to think not at all in the NHS, but we know that these things do happen. But I think there are quite strong sanctions and safeguards with the code of practice. And there are certainly, um, I would say that the we're talking about trade agreements. I think the future there is to have good country to country agreements. It doesn't have to be in the context of a trade agreement. It can be a freestanding freestanding agreement on international mobility um, of healthcare staff. Sorry, I've gone an awful lot, but I suppose it's my specialist topic really. No, don't don't apologize. That was a hugely helpful answer. And, and, and particularly in relation to some of your last points about how you frame uh, country to country agreements in a way which is mutually beneficial, because I can certainly recognize the potential for that. Um, there's a lot more I would like to unpick, but can I just push on, on, on one point, which was you were talking in, in your opening comments and perhaps in response to mine about um, recruitment, uh, about the additional places that uh, are available yes. um, in uh, some of the uh, health professions. But what's the point of additional places if uh, applications are falling? And, and what can be done um, uh, by local health uh, providers to work to, with universities to address that? Because I guess that's almost like the pay issue outside your control because people are looking into the NHS and thinking that's not where I want to work. Mm. I think if I, I mentioned sort of case studies and examples of where this is working locally, so I guess it's worth looking at those to see what makes the why, why is it that in some areas that they do get applications and they're able to fill places and people do filter through and in other areas that people don't and i imagine that it boils down to a very strong local relationship between the help between the employing organizations i.e the nhs trusts or community um, employers um, and their local schools and universities and their com and how involved they are in their local community. I think that makes a really, really big difference. Um, I'd, I'd be really other... okay to have, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably indulging yep. everybody else, but I'm perhaps seeing this as a member of the Health and Care Select Committee. Mm. Um, I'd be really interested in examples um, where that's working well, um, if you could share those perhaps offline. Yes, I think we could definitely, um, well, so certainly from NHS employers with a capital E, that they do an awful lot of work on this. Um, there is also the issue, I would say, of placements that it's one thing to um well one thing to recruit people onto training courses and uh, you know for healthcare professions there's then having the capacity in the um in in the well hospitals and community settings to actually offer people supervised placements which is very difficult in the current um staffing and funding situation um you know people need to have the practical experience as well as the theoretical training I think, thanks very much. I'm conscious I'm almost out of uh, my time. Martha, you've done a lot of work on this. Is there any quick point you'd like to make? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Kate has really covered this quite a lot. Um, on the on, on the F, on the ethical front, is it's a, it's a slightly tricky one. Um, I, I mean, I, I I take the point of applications, sort of sort of what's called passive recruitment, ultimately. Uh, from these red list countries. Now, red list is, is that's the name that, that's given in in the UK as a safeguarding list in um, in WHO. Um, normally, being the result of, of of individual applications. What we've looked at the data, however, is that it, what we've seen is that tr on a trust basis, you can see some quite significant increases. And this is in in the public sector um, in recruitment. Uh, from those countries, and that's even in, in excluding sort of major London trusts and training hospitals, where you'd sort of expect those those network 
effects to happen um and again I'm, I'm happy to hear and i think kate has more detail on, on essentially improvements and enforcement of um the, this code of conduct as we are quite concerned that essentially is a problem with enforcement perhaps a little bit of complacency happening in that front and sometimes these recruitment drives from those countries sort of were currently we think sort of ghana pakistan nigeria are actually ongoing and quite heavily publicized um and another thing that kate had raised was the sort of the possibility of transitioning from for example sort of transition within the within the nhs of training opportunities i think what we've seen happening and think was worrying us particularly is the situation in social care um which has obviously recently been added to the shortage occupation list you think that's an opportunity obviously to increase a workforce what what interviewees raised with us is the possibility that that actually increases these slightly scary practices in the private sector and that is primarily because social care is seen as a route into the nhs by applicants who for example are trying to sort of sit their equivalences um in that in that period of time um so that, that i think i think that interface needs to, to be looked at a little bit a little bit more carefully um in in the future i, I really do think otherwise this has been uh very much very much um covered by kate so i don't have more to add in the interest of time <laughs> okay m m many thanks for that and i better return to the chair now uh, thanks very much paul and uh, just uh, illustrating Kate's point about placements, we had an issue last year with the increase in medical students in uh, both domestic and coming into the UK in the difficulty in getting foundation posts. And unless they go through their two foundation years, they simply cannot practice as doctors. So, you know, it's not just a matter of getting people into university. We need to look at that whole supply chain, as Peter um, might call it. OK, if we can now pass on to Commissioner Hilary Benn uh, for the next question. Thanks very much indeed, Philippa. I want to turn to the subject's been raised already, which is the NHS and trade deals. But before I do that, can I just put one very quick question to you, uh, Tamara? Given what you said in your very interesting answer about divergence and relations with the EU, what do you think are the prospects for some kind of mutual recognition agreement with the EU when it comes to medicines? Which aspect of medicines do you mean? Do you mean regulatory content or process? Uh, I think the, the, do you be, mean, being prepared to accept each other's medicines, having tested them in our own jurisdiction. So you mean the batch testing? It, I mean the batch testing, the yes. The specific batch testing point. Yeah. Well, as you will be aware, Commissioner, that that is something that the UK wanted to negotiate in sure. the free trade agreement and was unable to do so. Um, I, I can only answer in the most impressionistic way at present because I don't have any research on this question. But certainly when I talk with people in Brussels, the UK is not high on their priority list. Okay. So, you know, they have other bigger fish to fry. They are trying to recover from the pandemic. You know, th there's all sorts of things going on in terms of the EU's global health um, arrangements. They have the new regulation for AI and so on going on. The, the UK is low on their priority list. So I think unless there is a major, ch and this is very impressionistic, I can't, you know, I can't substantiate it in any way. Unless there's a major change in orientation so that there's a desire to be much closer to the single market, I can't imagine that batch testing is going to be treated the same way as good manufacturing practice under okay. a future EU UK. No, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, can I start uh, with you, Nick? How worried are you that when the government says, well, the NHS is not up to sale in, in trade negotiations, and you've touched on this briefly already, how worried are you about this and what actually are you worried about? Um, thanks. Um, I am worried. I am worried that the government speaks with a forked tongue. Um, I'm worried uh, because I was active, uh, in, actively involved in the campaign around TTIP 
Um, and I was very aware that there were things being said by the government about the NHS being off the table, uh, which weren't true. I mean, there were assurances from Ign Ignacio um, Berceres, who, who said that the, the, the government had every right to exclude the NHS. But in fact, it appeared under the under the rules themselves, the government hadn't excluded the NHS and there were all sorts of issues about negative listing. There are future issues to consider about uh, subsidiaries of companies operating in the country which bypass those uh, restrictions. And it's no coincidence that we have an enormous number of uh, US healthcare corporations and their subsidiaries already operating general practice, operating hospital services, operate, potentially operating our data uh, through Palantir. Um, and it, it seems very US focused. So um, the NHS being off the table, I'm not sure is is a is a believable phrase. Actually, um, it's repeated okay. in it's repeated in the CPTPP, um, and it probably is right. true in the case of the CPTPP because actually there's not a lot uh, at risk for us in that agreement. But, but in what US, are you UK, what are you worried be. about will happen? What is the um, consequence that you're concerned about? Oh, the consequences are massive. I mean, in terms of the exposure of our medicines market to US pricing, for instance, we'd see enormous hikes in the increase uh, in the costs of our medicines and costs for us to buy them. Um, you know, making laxer regulations around um, holding patents, extending patents, increasing prices while patents are extant. Um, the workforce, uh, the, so with the, with the absolutely parlous state of the workforce and an almost willful neglect of planning for that workforce over the last 13 years, what we have seen is an expansion of the underskilled, what Kate was referring to, sort of uh, layers of underskilled staff, nursing associates, physicians associates, GP assistants, who are in fact be uh, that they're, they're prevalent in the US. It's a US model. It's it's part of the US model. They use under They use kind of underskilled staffing, um, to, and the problem is that they are being used to replace nurses and doctors. And I think there's probably a link there. The fact that uh, staffing qualified staff have not been expanded whilst uh, the assistants of the subsidiary staff have been vastly expanded. And I can tell you absolutely in, in, in general practice that the so-called kind of wraparound preventative care and offloading GPs via the ARRS roles um, in general practice hasn't worked. It hasn't reduced our workload. It hasn't really benefited patients. Um, and a lot of these things, there's nothing at the end of them. There's an awful lot of signposting um, with these underskilled roles, but very little resolution. Um, and I'm but, afraid there is no substitute for doctors and nurses. Right. But th but those are matters for domestic regulation. They're not a function of international trade agreements. And certainly as far as America is concerned, and I think you raise an important point about what they might seek in relation to drug prices, there is no prospect of a trade deal with the United States on the horizon. As has become a, a very evident because they're not interested in having one with the United Kingdom. Can I put the same question to others? What, what is it that you're worried about? I don't know who would like to come in. Kate? Um, yes, um, I, I would agree with you that a lot of, I mean, a lot of Nick's concerns are legitimate, but I don't think that they relate directly to our trade agreements with other countries and certainly not specifically to the CPTPP. Right. Um, the deals that the UK has signed so far don't commit health services um, in their government procurement commitments, for example, and they don't go beyond what is already permissible in the NHS internal market in England. And, um, you know, as other people have pointed out, well, Nick himself said, just said that, you know, there's a long history um, in successive governments of, um, if you like, allowing a degree of privatisation in the NHS. So this has been happening for a long time. Um, and UK and international companies have for a long time been able to bid to provide NHS services and do so. 
Um, the devil is in the detail. Somebody mentioned the sort of legal uh, sort of fudging. Um, yeah, the text that the CPTPP and indeed the other agreements that the UK has signed um, specifies, you know, says effectively the NHS isn't on the table, that uh, specifies uh, the right to regulate in the public interest and protection for legitimate public welfare objectives. Um, there's always this sort of little grey area about how exactly how that would be interpreted in a particular case. I suppose the two things that might be grey areas, there's been a lot of concern about um, the investor state dispute um, parts, uh, well, aspect of the CPTPP. Um, I mean, in well, cer certainly in theory, it means that um, a company, an investor could um, decide to challenge some decision around um, standards of public health, for example, some decision that was made by a future um, UK government, and they could decide to try and challenge that through the investor state um, dispute mechanism. I think it I think it's a remote possibility. I don't think there is actually any instance of the UK ever having lost such a case. Um, yeah. um, it would, I think the, the bar, the standard is pretty high, though there are concerns about how much it would cost to you know, defend such a case and the so-called chilling effect, whether or not, in fact, governments might think twice about introducing certain public health measures just in case a company were to challenge them. I'm, it's very hard to tell because it's speculative. It's all hypothetical. We don't really know whether this is actually likely to happen, whether it's, an, if you like, a relatively unfounded fear or something that's a genuine concern. But it's certainly something that's possible um, under the text of the agreement. Um, the other, yeah, I mean, th th there are sort of issues. That, so some of them are very remote. Things like if the, U if the United States were ever to rejoin the CPTPP, that could change things significantly as things stand at the moment. So, for example, um, the UK already has existing ISDS provisions in agreements with seven out of the CPTP, that, that terrible acronym, <laughs> um, that tongue twister, CPTPP member countries. Uh, we've, you know, we've got existing agreements with uh, seven of them, um, not with the rest. Um, so that may be a bit of a red herring, to be honest. Um, the other issues, I suppose, would be um, medicines. Again, I don't think there is anything explicitly um, in the agreement that um, no, nothing explicit that would impact the UK medicines pricing system, which is very effective. As Nick said, I mean, the, the, the amount that people pay that the yeah. United States healthcare system pays for medicines is unbelievable compared with what we have in the UK. We have yeah, a very have good a, yeah. system. We do but, indeed. But, yeah. but there is this concern about the possibility of patent extensions that could um, possibly lead to some delay in um, the in generic medicines. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. In other, you know, if the branded medicine is extended for longer, then it means that um, the NHS might end up paying a bit more for slightly longer um, for, the branded, the for the branded medicine. Yeah. No, that is really helpful. But, Thank you, uh, but, Tamara. Not huge. So I think I can summarise my concern uh, in that. I don't think the phrase the NHS being on the table in a trade negotiation is at all helpful. And I think what, what is much more helpful is a much more granular public debate about the specific elements that we're talking about. So we're talking about um, the English NHS for certain things. We're talking about tiny elements of, in, in Scotland. We're, we're talking about intellectual property. We're talking about medicines pricing and we're talking about investors, investors uh, dispute investor state dispute settlement. So I, I just think that the public debate in terms of the NHS being on the table is, is woefully inadequate. I think we need to have a much more honest and detailed conversation that's not in these kind of ideological terms, but that practically recognizes that in some regards, the NHS is on the table. And, and that's because of domestic decisions. It's nothing to do with our trade relations. Um, and in some regards, there are things that are a worry and that can be looked at in terms of specific, detailed wording in trade agreements, which, as Kate has outlined, are often there. They're, 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 they are in, in the text. Um, I suspect that Nick may not agree with me, 
but that's that's that would be how I would answer that question. Okay, Nick, I could see that you wanted to come back, and and would you like to do so? Uh, your mute. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. No, I don't substantially disagree with you, Tamara. I think oh. granular detail is actually helpful, and I'd include in that data is a is an awfully big one. Um, uh, I did. The reason I wanted to come back was just in just about the ISDS uh, and what's actually already happened. And although it's a theoretical risk, it's a very real risk. Um, for instance, Slovakia decided to make its uh, help to to make its health insurance system non-profit, uh, and they were sued. Um, Germany was sued for I think it was about seven billion for deciding to shut its nuclear power stations um, by the Vattafall Swedish firm, and they won. Um, the, the the Swedish firm won, and Australia, of course, was sued by Philip Morris for bringing in um, plain packaging on its cigarettes. So these are very real examples of um, governments being sued for very large sums by industry for it, for implementing health public health measures in the public interest and we need to be wary of that and, and the, the detail and get and what the lawyers make of it is is most important there i think okay thank you very much Eugene. back to you philippa uh, thanks very much uh hillary and while it wasn't through an isds obviously the minimum unit pricing of alcohol in scotland was held up for five years by being challenged in court so you know industry has often a vested interest in not seeing either environmental or public health uh, measures go ahead so I, I think i think it is looking at the detail and um, we come now to commissioner uh, jeff mackey uh, who's going to cover the next two questions uh, thanks very much chair um can i pick up quickly two or three of the themes we've just talked about with cptpp um we've talked a lot about the challenges could I just ask about any opportunities people can see within the health healthcare sector? Kate, any opportunities in, in that accession? Yeah, I think I've already referred to some of these that, um, you know, CPTPP is a big market. Um, I think that... I mean, Does it outweigh the challenges? I don't think I could. I don't think I could commit myself either way on that. But yeah, the opportunities are that I think we could promote the UK as an attractive destination for inward investment, particularly in um, uh, research, innovation, life sciences. Uh, particularly, you know, if the CPTPP um, results in reducing barriers um, for um, for exporters, for UK exporters, that could be a big win. I think. Um, there's the uh, the data elements, you know, encouraging data flow and digital trade, um, speeding up licensing of new products. I think there are you know, all sorts of um, possibilities there. But the UK is already a major recipient of foreign direct investment in uh, pharma and medical devices, and it's, it's the global centre for research and life sciences. So I think this is a, a linchpin of the government's, um, if you like, economic life sciences, life sciences strategy. Um, the yeah, I mean the downs. Yeah, I think those are. The, I would say that those are the main opportunities. It's an opportunity to uh, reduce regulatory barriers, to speed up access to and um, cost of some of the things that we want, uh, to improve our supply chains, and also an opportunity for exporting. I imagine that Peter might have something um, to say about that. Yeah, I was just moving on to Peter. Um, Peter, I, I acknowledge your remark about your DBT NDA. Um, would you like to share your views with us, please? Sure. Um, I think it's, it's it's good to have more markets to access for companies. It's back to a um, an economically active country is better for its citizens for their health, and you know accessing these markets is strong. I think the other thing that's important about it is it forms the backbone of the countries that are involved in the um, MDSAT program, which is a regulatory alignment program. And that's good for trade. Uh, as I said, right at the head of this session, um, regulatory is one of the major barriers. And that, to be clear, is not about lower regulatory standards. It's about alignment on regulatory standards where we can. Um, so I think that's good. N nothing wrong with that. The US isn't in it. Um, 
should the US enter it, of course, it's going to change the uh, the nature of it. But I, I think there, you come back to the US, I mean, they issue their own edicts, just as China has done, about reshoring technology and um, taking everything back within their own borders. So there, there is a tension there. Um, but yes, CP, TPP, good. Thank you. Tommy. Just super quickly, others may have better information sources than we do, but we struggle to answer this kind of question because of the lack of transparency of, of um, available information in terms of um, granular negotiating texts. OK, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to leave that there unless anybody else to chip in anything. I'd like to move on. Um, given the conversation we've got about trading decisions on public health, are there any likely effects in the future we need to be concerned about? Can we actually use any conversation in and around the trade deals to improve public health as part of this conversation? Martha, could we start with you, please? Yeah, so I think we've actually touched on a few of these previously, but if, so to sort of re-summarize it. Um, so, Part of it is around the ability to legislate progressively around public health, which does have a devolved aspect to it. Um, now, so others, other have, other others have raised the possibility of sort of disputing internationally through ISDS any measures on, on public health. And it did rightly raise, for example, anti-tobacco measures where, where the Australian government actually won, but obviously that can have a chilling effect on governments considering their costs when um, negotiating these measures. The other one is actually sort of remaining uncertainty through the Internal Market Act on what happens, for example, if the Scottish or Welsh government, as they have previously, or Northern Irish government, decide to um, legislate on alcohol or um, or tobacco. Um, there's been sort of poor engagement and that some other things sort of relate to public health on, on, on a population basis. Um, so, for example, uh funding that came from the eu and went directly to the uk devolved nations um on things like um life sciences and cancer hospitals um we heard from the people we interviewed on on, on our project that there's a very very poor engagement we know that that funding is going to be essentially repatriated to westminster and then redistributed from there to individual countries the engagement has been pretty woeful uh, from, from central government. We still don't understand what the sums are and, and how they're going to be redistributed, and that could have a, a fairly significant impact. Uh, Kate has already mentioned distributional inequalities from uh, sort of potential trade deals. Uh, it's been very interesting work done by the IFS uh, on essentially the impact of Brexit, and that would be considering Brexit almost as an anti-trade deal with trade barriers going up, and the effect is ultimately that uh, blue-collar areas in manufacturing are particularly badly hit. Um, and obviously, we've got the the example of U.S. trade deals um, such as uh, NAFTA and China having um, similar effects, um, and that's something that we want to um, to look at. Um, sort of to counter the narrative of, you know, all round uplift and economic sort of job creation um, through trade deals. Um, also, there's a, a, a slight concern that sort of by opening by opening up your markets through trade deals, um, you'd open access uh, on, on an equal level to a certain amount of, of food products. Um, with standards that might be more concerning. So whether to raise, for example, um, you know, Australian meat and pesticides. Um, um, so yes, that ultimately we'd be um we'd sort of be locking in that that access and compromising um our own standards for this. I've I've sort of summarized, but I want to leave sort of others the time to discuss if they want to. Thank you. The the challenge across the sector is to look for the positives. Um yeah. <laughs> That's part of the challenge. Nick, within the health sector and public health, how can we use these conversations? 
it's probably not my area of expertise in terms of trade. I, I see public as a clinician, well, as someone from the NHS, I see uh, public health is very much an upstream. Uh, non, in, people talk about prevention, but that largely doesn't happen in medicine. It happens in housing and food standards and economic growth um, and education. Um, and I see that we've lost a lot of those um, benefits from Bre uh, of Brexit. We've lost a lot of benefits um, on all of those things, um, aside from sort of funding and research cooperation, things that will generally improve our, uh, our, our healthy life expectancy. Um, which is where I see public health fundamentally. Um, so it's it's not so much in the medicines and what we can do in terms of um, health policy. It's very much more about public health, and and that lies with having a strong public health uh, discipline faculty uh, in the UK, which has been completely disassembled really um, since well, first the Health and Social Care Act 2012, and then during COVID with the abolition of the public health agency. Um, so we're, I think we're very weak in terms of uh, public health, and I, I'd be looking to people like Michael Marmot to get a much better idea of uh, the domestic situation and then translate that into what that might mean for our agriculture, you know, agriculture, farming, those things are all at risk here at the moment. I feel those sectors are suffering um, and that impacts uh, up the line on, on public health. Yeah, I think one of the questions of teasing some of these topics apart is part of the challenge in public health analysis. Tammy. Thank you. Um, I mean, just to, to build on that a little bit, it depends on how you assess the European Union's um, contribution globally to public health standards. Um, you know, there's no doubt that the, the European Union has gone further than any other trade bloc in terms of tobacco regulation, for example. That's definitely public health protecting. Um, air and water quality is another example that's often associated with the EU, but then also the EU's far approach to farming is, is not particularly public health protecting. So uh, from what I understand from people who work in this sector, actually the UK has been able to move further in terms of habitat protection than it could within the EU. But for the bits of public health that are affected by trade agreements, I, I, I do think that we should be discussing greater alignment with the EU as a global power that does protect public health in the context of not only its internal trade agreement, but also its trade agreements with the rest of the world. And I don't think discussion of alignment with the EU or deeper trade agreements with the EU should be off the table. I think we should be realistic about this rather than ideological about this. Thank you. Martha, you wanted to come back in. Yes, sorry. Um sort of looking to the first part of the question and and maybe slightly answering um sort of Nick's question about um sort of public health as uh, as a non-public health thing as a wider economy problem um I'm afraid it, it's an impact rather than a solution but um what we we look at on we we were looking at the the sort of effects of, of, of brexit on, on on health outcomes and if we sort of look at it in terms of economic downturn downturn obviously the OBR has um, sort of been confirmed in its estimate of, of a 4% loss of GDP following uh, following Brexit in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. What that ultimately means is a decrease in real income, a decrease in ability to afford fooding and decent housing. And we, we know that, that that sort of has a downstream um, impact on, on health and um, and health outcomes. So yes, that's that's just to really add a little bit more detail. Thank you. Peter. Um, so not in a trade agreement, but from um, a duty for our trade department to encourage cities in the UK um, at a, a, a wider city level to actually get out and look and collaborate with others around the world who are having the same problems in both public health, um, you know, whether that's around obesity, childhood issues, um, homelessness, etc. Uh, you know, I go to places regularly like Austin, Memphis, um places in florida they've all got similar problems what they do do locally through their chambers of commerce often is come together and collaborate industry health leadership and the city um in austin there is a healthcare council which brings together all the competing healthcare providers and the city 
and they're doing work that looks at how do we make this a good place for citizens. So sometimes it, it doesn't have to be written down as what's the deal, but it needs to be um, providing, encouraging, um, stimulating, you know, maybe even give cities grants to do it. But get out and learn from others and build collaboration. Thank you. That's useful. And as the last word on this one, Kate. Um, I just wanted to make, make a factual point, really, which is, um, I mean, that there are more questions than answers when it comes to public health, because as I said earlier about something else, it's hypothetical. And, you know, until the U it depends on decisions made by whatever the UK government is at the time as to what we want to do domestically and, you know, what what legislative changes we might want to make, for example, when it comes to, you know, food standards or pollution, whatever. Um, but just a factual point about CPTPP that, um, I mean, in the text of the agreement that it, members must recognise each other's, um, I can never remember this, um, sanitary and phytosanitary SPS rules. Uh, they have to recognise each other's measures as equivalent where they achieve the same objectives. And there is this issue about um, this clearly is moving away from the precautionary principle um, that the EU employs, which is I think different from most other global standards to um, what is generally referred to as a scientific or evidence-based approach. Um, and it's very controversial because it may not result in, as to whether this simply means different standards that achieve the same outcomes, um, not necessarily lower standards, but um, you know that is something that is definitely there in the CPTPP agreement and where there is obviously a difference between what we've seen in the past when we've adhered to EU norms and what we may be moving to in the future. But other people, um, particularly perhaps Tammy, may want to comment on that. Thanks very much, Kate. I think one of the conversations strategically about both the precautionary principle, the innovation principle and the balance between them is one of the challenges for all these conversations. Uh, Chair, handing back to you, if I may, please. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. And, and obviously, we've got in there to the difference between health care, which is about illness, and health, which is almost about everything else. And obviously, the, the, the language we're beginning to see in recent years more around well-being economy, actually investing in the well-being and health and well-being of citizens, actually bringing about economic growth. So a lot of what we're talking about today, one hand washes the other, um, but it is exactly that difference between an illness service uh, and what generates genuine health. And of course, trade deals and government decisions affect both. Okay, for our final question, over to Commissioner Charles Rose. Uh, thanks, Philip. Um, this has been an extremely wide ranging discussion this morning, and I think uh, extraordinarily informative. But I want to now narrow it down and ask each of the, each of the witnesses today what three key policy recommendations would they have for the UK government when it comes to the UK health sector? And I'd like to start that with Martha, if you don't mind. I mean, I think the, a really, really important one that's come through in our work again is the need for transparency and openness um, and scrutiny and a proper public conversation um, about what, what what our options are seems pretty basic but it me it makes it me it makes our work easier it makes it makes the benefits and and, and the risks clearer um and I, I mean if 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 that were one i'd have to pick that one on uh, another one that comes up specifically um sort of, sort of in my work a lot more is is long-term planning uh for workforce um i think i'd like to sort of leave it to those two to be honest and uh be it to my yeah but a bit a bit motherhood and that was high but uh, let's, uh, simple but very necessary nonetheless um can i move this on to you peter sure um charles frankly on trade we need to be better at specific um, advisors for the sector and funding for individual sectors, this one being life sciences. Um, we are behind the game compared to places like Germany, um, the Netherlands, Sweden, um, the, the US, 
who provide companies with a lot of support. Our support in, I would say, the last 15 years has taken an incredible downward turn. So we need to get trade back to helping companies to export, frankly. And then internally, it's doing what we can to get regulatory alignment that will help those early stage companies to export and um, others to come in here and in would invest. I chair a, a small business in health, and I can tell you, if I didn't have to do a CE mark historically to prepare a product, and I could have done another jurisdiction, I would have done, um, it would have been no less rigorous, but it would have been done in a timely, more cost-efficient manner, and would have allowed us to attract investment because it would have made us market ready to go elsewhere. So invest in our trade department, make sure it's sector specific aligned and think about regulation. Charles, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Nick, from a clinician's point of perspective? Well, not specifically to do with trade, well, yes, to do with trade deals um, uh, or not. I mean, we need the health sector beefed up and made functional. We need uh, some strength to be negotiating from. Um, personally, uh, I would renationalize the NHS and social care and in terms of trade deals, that would ensure it's a non-economic service of general interest and therefore exempt without um, without further ado. I'd fund and resource the NHS specifically to the at least to the uh, OECD average and that's beds, that's MRI scanners and CT scanners, that's doctor nurse patient ratios. Um, all of those things that have been lacking and lagging for the last 13 years uh, to actually, you know, they're simple things and actually what's wrong with the health service is fairly simple um, and uh, with an overarching umbrella of neglect, this is what happens. Um, and the third thing would be um, uh, regular one-list reviews. Um, Derek Wanless was uh, employed to do a bi biannual reviews of, um, biannual reviews, of um, a, a workforce situation and if that was done absolutely rigorously and properly we wouldn't be in this situation now. Um, as far as trade deals go I would certainly ensure that the NHS is negatively listed if that's what it takes or as I say uh, uh, you know protected as a state-owned enterprise. I would want to set up an NHS um, owned state-owned generic pharma uh, uh, company uh, in this country, I think it would be an enormous asset to the country for us, A, to be able to produce generics, uh, and B, how that would link into our life sciences, our research and our education and training of our future doctors and nurses, etc. Um, and the third thing would be very tight eye on regulation and standards um, as regards medicines costs and their production. Um, and the avoid the what I it was a minister, I think, who actually said that basically if the FDA and the EMA approve something, what problem have we got? We should just be rubber stamping it. So I'd be looking very, very carefully at how we take our regulatory benchmarks. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. I think that's a list of slightly more than three, but it's a big set of issues. Stop. Uh, can we move quickly on to uh, to Kate and then to Tammy? Um, yeah, um, yes, I'm, I'm going to cheat horribly and, and point out that um, I sent written evidence with 11 recommendations, not three, um, to the Secretariat, so um, which I would um, recommend that you, well, ask you all to go away and read because that gives me 11 goes instead of just three points to make. Um, because there were too many to fit into three. Um, Great answer. But, yeah. <laughs> well, but 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 I would say, yeah, if, if I'm being asked for three points, um, what are we looking for from future trade deals? Uh, I think do everything possible to position the UK to influence international regulatory standards that impact in any way um, on the NHS. And to well, that's that's one point. And the second point would be to use whatever leverage we have in trade deals. Um, to benefit uh, patients in the NHS by making it easier to get the supplies um, and the staff that we need. Thank you. And do have time for a last word from uh, Tammy? I'll only say one thing, uh, which is that I would like 
us to have an honest national conversation about the, the trade-offs here and about it on the basis of the UK being a small player in global industries and also on the basis of not a narrative of the NHS being the best in the world but actually comparing our performance in our four healthcare systems with other healthcare systems in similar countries or even not similar countries in terms of levels of development. So I think a, a, an honest conversation about the pros and cons of different decisions in terms of our trading position and what they would mean for the NHS, that would be the one thing that I would ask for. No thank more you. slogans. Thank you very much. And uh, Philippa, back to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow commissioners and also our five witnesses for what has been a very interesting and wide ranging session. And as always, I would like to thank the Secretariat Best for Britain for all the work they've done in the background to set this uh, witness session up today. So my thanks to all of you. Goodbye. <laughs>